Hey, Crossing Recovery. We're going to join together and sing today. We're going to lift up this prayer. God's will be done on earth as in heaven. Sing with me. We bring our praise. We bring our praise. You bring a revival. We lift our heads. You lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. No fear. Oh God, your kingdom come. Your will be done here. On earth as in heaven. Spirit of God, pour out hearts so wide open. Oh, Jesus, we need you now. Come have your way in this place. Break our walls down. Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. Jesus, we need you now. We bring our shame. You bring redemption. Oh, you turn our chains into our freedom. Where your love is found, God. Oh, where your love is found, there will be no fear. Oh, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done here. So we sing on earth as in heaven. Spirit of God, pour out hearts so wide open. Oh, Jesus, we need you now. Come have your way in this place. Break our walls down. Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. Oh, Jesus, we need you now, yeah, we need you, we need you, Holy Spirit, bring revival in your presence, in your presence, there is peace, in your presence, we are free. There's no better place to be. There's no better place to be. In your presence there is truth. In your presence mountains move. We forever run to you. We forever run to you. In your presence there in your presence we are free there's no better place to be there's no better place to be in your presence mountains move in your presence there is truth and we forever run to you we forever We need you now. Come have your way in this place. Break our walls down. Spirit of God, pour out on earth as in heaven. 
Jesus, we need you now, yeah. Oh, we need you. We need you, God. Oh. We continue tonight. We lean into the confidence that we have in Christ. We know that he is working up ahead on the path. He's paving a way for us. Let's sing this together. I have this confidence. I have this confidence because I've seen the faithfulness of God still inside the stone. The promise of the shore I trust the power of your word Enough to seek your kingdom first Beyond the barren place Beyond the ocean waves Sing it out When I walk through the waters I won't be overcome When I go through the rivers I will not be drowned My God will make a way So I am not afraid And He keeps His promises You keep the promises you make there isn't one that is delayed So I will not lose heart Here I will lift my arms And start to sing into the night My praise will call the sun to rise Declare the battle won Declare that it is done I won't be overcome when I go through the rivers. I will not be drowned. My God will make a way. So I am not afraid when I am in the fire. I will not feel the flame. I stand before the giant declaring victory. And my God will make a way. So I am not afraid before me, behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley, where you won't find me, no, I am not afraid. Sing that again. Before me, behind me, always beside me, no shadow, no valley. Where you won't find me, no, I am not afraid. No, I am not afraid. When I walk through the waters, I won't be overcome. When I go through the rivers, I will not be drowned. My God will make a way. So I Stand before the giant Declaring victory My God will make a way So I am not afraid My God will make a way So I am not afraid No, I am not afraid No, I am not afraid Jesus, we lean into that today. We know you have plans for us. That you're working all things out for the good who love you. So we reach out to you today because there are giants in our path. There are things we can't see past. And we just trust in you. We reach out to you. 
We don't fear because you are with us, but these times are hard. God, we thank you for the comfort, the peace that we find in you. I just pray that in every circumstance that we can fix our eyes on you. Thank you for saving us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for life. We thank you for a reason to worship. In your name we pray, amen. Well, thank you for joining us uh, today. It's so great to sing these songs together. Hey, before we continue, why don't you drop your name in the chat, say hey to us. We're so glad you're here. Hello and welcome, Crossing Recovery family. Man, I'm glad you're here, and I hope you are buckled in and ready to go because today we are going to talk about step eight. Made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. And I'll tell you, this is one of the most challenging steps, right? Making a list of people you've harmed and becoming willing to apologize and right your wrongs. It's tough in part because it involves taking an honest look at just how much your hurts, habits, and hangups have impacted the people around you and then pushing into that dark, scary zone to communicate with those people and take personal responsibility for any harm you caused. If it doesn't make you at least a little sweaty just thinking about it, you probably haven't started to take it seriously yet. I wanna walk through a large chunk of scripture with you tonight, Acts 3, 1 through 21. We don't usually do that, I know. It can be tough to track through a long passage that someone else is reading to you, but this is just so relevant to our topic and I'll give my commentary as we go. That should break things up fairly nicely. All right, let's dive in. So Acts chapter three, verse one. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, at three o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. Now many believe that addiction is a disease that people are born with. I tend to agree, but even if you don't, I think we can all agree that many of us start to encounter the sort of deeply dysfunctional environments that foster addictive behavior as soon as we are old enough to think, feel, and create memories. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the beautiful gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. Now stop and think through this with me for a moment. This man has never known a single day when he could simply navigate through his physical surroundings like everyone else around him. What words would you, do, would you use to describe that? Hard? Brutal, deeply, routinely challenging. I mean, people had to carry him always, every time. And they would carry him to the beautiful gate so he could lay there and ask for money from strangers. Now, I don't know if your addiction ever took you to a place where you had to panhandle to fill your stomach. I haven't. My addiction hasn't done that. But that's where my son is right now. And it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking in large part because I can only imagine what that must do to his self-image. I try not to imagine the things people must say to him and do to him on a regular basis. It, it kills me. All right, back to the Bible. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, look at us. Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. Again, this is a great place to pause and empathize with the protagonist of our story. He fixed his attention on them. I'll bet he did. I'm betting that a part of him sensed the presence of the Holy Spirit, along with the presence of the disciples as they walked into that space. Or maybe he was afraid. I'm pretty sure that most people simply ignored him. A few would occasionally drop him a coin, but how many actually made eye contact with him, let alone spoke with him and engaged in some sort of conversation? And of those who did, how many followed that more direct form of contact with abuse? There's no way to know, but I think it's safe to say that he fixed his gaze on them knowing that something was different. Maybe he was hopeful. Maybe, despite the unquestionably difficult nature of his life, he looked at them with hope, expecting to receive something from them. All right, Acts 3, 6. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? 
I mean, I know it's the Bible, right? I know it's Jesus, and I know Jesus does miracles and all of that, but let's not skip past the, the, the gravity and the glory of this moment. He took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And this is how our God works, right? We look to him or his human representatives expecting something, and boom, whatever we're hoping or praying for is blown right out of the frame. Sometimes, like this man, we realize it right away in the moment. It's obvious. It's spectacular. Sometimes it takes years for us to figure out. Sometimes our whole life. All right, Acts 3.8. <clears throat> Jumping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. Come on. Are you smiling? You should be smiling. I honestly believe that gratitude is the most obvious, glorious blessing God gives us. So good walking, leaping. I mean, can't you see him and just feel what he's feeling and praising God? All of that reminds me of being in the room when we meet in person at CR and worship. So good. All right, Acts 3.9. All the people saw him walking and praising God and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. <laughs> right? God's miracles are always intended to be just the epicenter of God's impact. The glory and blessings, they spread out in concentric circles from that person God has dropped the blessing bomb on. Think of the power that was unleashed in all their lives as they saw hard evidence of a long, difficult life redeemed and converted to joy. Acts 3.11. While they clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Portico, utterly astonished. When Peter saw it, he addressed the people. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this or, or stare at us as though by our power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus. All good so far, right? It's not us, it's Jesus. Give the glory where it belongs. It's not our piety, it's, it's Jesus. But it goes on whom you have handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. Uh-oh, right? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors are, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this, we are a witness. Oh, shoot, right? This is not going well anymore. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. <laughs> boom, Again, boom, just imagine all the rationalizations and silent excuses that were going on inside the heads of the people who were there. <laughs> Crazy. And now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. And you just hear him going, yeah, that's right. I didn't mean it. I didn't do it. I was just, I was uninformed. I was poorly led. Mm-hmm. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Whoa, that escalated quickly, didn't it? Let's look at these last three verses and kind of unpack this a little bit. Repent. He's saying, look in the mirror, accept and recognize that the person looking back at you screwed it up. Own it. Experience regret. Feel bad about what you did or said. Acknowledge where you missed the mark and express regret. Seek forgiveness. Now as humans, we hate this. One of the most basic components of social psychology is a concept called cognitive dissonance. The idea is that we all want to think of ourselves as good people, and so we're strongly resistant to any evidence to the contrary. And when I say strongly, I mean strongly. This desire for our concept of self to line up with what we think of as good is utterly core to who we are and what we do. 
Getting to a place where we can own our mistakes and repent is truly, deeply difficult and risky. It can cause us to look into the deep and force us to deal with what we find there. That's why many people find step eight to be so challenging. It challenges our ability to feel good about ourselves and can stir our desire to give in to our addiction. It's scary. It's hard. It's risky. Do not do it alone. Get in a step study. Pray hard for a sponsor. Be in community. But look what comes with the repentance. Your sins are wiped out. Hello? Your sins are wiped out. They are separated as far from you as east is from west. You'd think that would be enough to keep all of us on our knees repenting several hours each day. But wait, there's more. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Man, I don't know about you, but a time of refreshing coming from the presence of Jesus Christ sounds so good to me. It sounds incredible. My soul cries out for that kind of refreshing. And that, he may, and that he may send the Messiah appointed for you, that is Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration that God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Well, the theology gets pretty deep pretty quick here. But it certainly seems that Jesus' return is somehow critically connected to our repentance, seeking forgiveness, and even making amends. I'll leave you to pray on that and seek clarity from the Spirit, but wow. That's clearly a big deal. And taken to, altogether, the banishment of our sins, a time of refreshing with our Lord, and the return of Jesus certainly provides all the motivation and enticement we need to move forward, right? But before we talk about the practical steps of moving on, let's pause for a moment and ponder, why is tracking your past wrongs, repentance, and becoming willing to make amends so incredibly important? Not just to the recovery process, but apparently to all of creation. The answer, of course, is complex and rich with the reality of God's love and his incredible plan to allow us to participate in overcoming our sins and choosing to depend on, instead on grace. Most human beings are desperate for control, self-sufficiency, and independence, right? Just to bring it home, it's the core of the American dream, isn't it? You can be anything you want to be as long as you set goals, have a plan, and work hard enough. Don't make excuses, don't display weakness, fight, 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 and never ever apologize as you do what you need to do to win success, right? Well, all of that is wrapped around the core idea that you are sufficient, that you can make good choices, that you can set good goals, that you can work hard enough, and that you can create success, that you are in control. The opposite course appears to be weakness and dependency. And we hate that. That in fact, many, many of us may be using our hurts, habits, and hangups to flee exactly that truth, that we are weak and dependent. But that is in fact the truth that sets us free. Not just free from hurts, habits, and hangups, but free from depending on ourselves. Come on, come with me here. Free from constraining our vision to providing for ourselves and our families before we can look out for others. Free from thinking that we can only act like humans at a capacity limited by our own thoughts, abilities, competencies, and work ethic. Repentance, acknowledging that we're not sufficient, that we're not enough on our own, that our independence, goals, plans, and hard work are often just the product of sin and carry sin's impact to the people around us, that we have screwed up and hurt ourselves and others as proof that we're not Jesus, points us to Jesus. In fact, it's the only way to get there. As long as we're in charge and in control, we can't surrender to blissful dependency on Jesus. We can't embrace the incredible freedom of loving God first, loving others as we love ourselves, and trusting God to take care of us. We've got to acknowledge our own helpless insufficiency before we can be swept away by the glory of God's perfection. Okay? Okay. So let's get practical and take a look at how to go about this. How do we go about making a solid, comprehensive list of all the people we've harmed? Let's start by generating four basic categories. One, people you hurt with your words. People you hurt with your words. 
Two, people you hurt with your actions. People you hurt with the things that you did. Three, people you hurt by keeping quiet. People you hurt by being silent. And number four, people you hurt looking out for yourself instead of looking out for others. Essentially, people you hurt by not acting when you should have acted. And by the way, on a personal note, this is about as far as I got. Just generating these, ca these categories and beginning to think about examples for each one before I got gut sick, before my heart started to drop and my stomach started to turn over. This will be true for many of you as well. Many of us will feel a strong urge to dip back into our addictions as well. It's a seriously difficult step. And the experience I'm describing is just one more very real, very powerful enticement to get down to the crossing Monday nights at 6.15, stick around and get involved in an open share group, hopefully a 12-step study, just as quickly as you possibly can. All right, that's my pitch. Back to the hard work. Again, I don't have the sort of hard, violent past that fills so many CR testimonies. But when I think of the person God created me to be, a source of living water for those around me, someone who lifts others up, points them towards Jesus and dispenses abiding love and radical grace so that others know they are deeply loved and wildly valuable. This stuff tears me up. And all those things I just said about me, by the way, are also equally true of you. That's what God made all of us for. So, people I hurt with my words. For years before I met my wife, I used my words to convince a string of women I loved them so that they would have sex with me. I won't share their names, but I know who they are. People I hurt with my actions. Mike. Mike and I were great friends. What a great guy. Until I got drunk, totaled my car with him in it, sent him to the hospital overnight, and then ended our friendship. I essentially just ghosted him because I, I was too embarrassed to face up to what I'd done. People I hurt by keeping quiet. I can't, I can't count the number of times I went drinking with people whose racist rhetoric got louder the drunker they got, and I just laughed along with them. People I hurt looking out for myself instead of others. Danny, Rob, Donald, and Dave. They all killed themselves. Danny and Rob, quick and dramatic when we were all still young. Don and Dave, slow and painful over the years. All of this while I focused on feeding my own addiction, totally ignorant to their pain. All right, that's as far as I can go down that path right now. So let's talk about apologies, understanding that I'm looking forward here a little bit because this step is just making the list and becoming ready to make amends. And now I'm talking about how to actually make amends, but I think this is important stuff and it's, it's a good life wisdom for us to all carry. What are the components of a strong apology? These are the three that my dad taught me. Accept responsibility, own it. It's you, you did it, no one else is responsible, this is yours. Express regret, hey man, I am sorry. I am so sorry this happened. I'm so sorry that I did this. I can see how this hurt. And I really, I apologize for that. And finally, communicate your plan for doing better and not repeating the same or similar mistake. Hey man, I see the damage I did. I, I know what happened or a little bit about how we got there. And here's what I'm doing to make sure that I never put myself in that position to cause that kind of pain to anyone else ever again. Okay? So one, accept responsibility. Two, express regret. Three, communicate your plan for doing better and not repeating the same or similar mistake. Now, finally, making the list is hard, but how do we become ready to make amends? It's the same answer every week, right? Can you guess? Pray, surrender. Get in community and make this journey with others. Get down to the crossing next Monday at 615. Worship, learn, and get in a group. You cannot, do not want to do this alone. All right, let me pray us out. God, we love you. We trust you. We are thankful for your presence in our lives. Amen. I, I think I start almost all my prayers exactly that way because I want so badly for those things to be true. I want all of us to be able to love you more, to trust you more completely, to spend more of our lives living in gratitude. God, and I hope 
that at least some of the words I spoke tonight are words that you gave me and then they have reached deep into the hearts of the people watching this message online. I hope folks out there are going, yeah, man, I want my sins to be just cast away from me as far as east is from west. I want to experience a time of refreshing with my Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to participate, I guess, somehow in some small way in, in, in hastening the day when Christ comes back and makes this world right. God, we love you. We trust you. We are thankful for your presence. And I am hoping and praying that you work here tonight in the hearts of these people and bring just so many of them down to the crossing next week for worship, for learning, for open share groups, for 12-step studies, and that you would be glorified and right in the middle of all of it. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, now normally this is where we do announcements and I invite everyone to come down to the crossing at 6.15 go to CR and get involved in a step study or an open share group, but I've already done that. So I'm just going to close. Wish you a fantastic week. I look forward to seeing you next week, whether it's here online or in person. Be well. <laughs>